Russell. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for the hunt for the X-15 rocket plane. From 1959 to 1968, NASA operated three North American aviation rocket planes to great effect. In 199 flights, they generated over 700 technical papers on aerodynamics and set altitude and speed records for winged vehicles not exceeded until the space shuttle many years later. In 1993, so that's like 30 years ago, uh, our presenter, David Ball, organized a search in the Mojave Desert for, part, uh, for parts from the X-15 number three, which came apart in flight back in 1967. Today, he will share what made the X-15 the greatest research plane ever built, as well, his, as well as his theory on why one of them was lost. And so, as I said, uh, David Ball is the presenter today. He's a volunteer educator with, the, with, uh, with NASA uh, as a solar system ambassador with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He presents topics related to American activities in space. Whew. So all of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to David for joining us uh, this morning, this afternoon on this 80 degree day. Uh, and David, you can take it away. Thanks so much. The energy with that. I mean, you could you could get to, to orbit from from Robert's uh, energy. Th thank you so much. Uh, it's it's a delight to be with you again. Um, I, I love uh, the 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 work that Robert does in in organizing these events, and we always get wonderful uh, participation. Um, I, hopefully, my dad is is out there in the audience. He he uh, helped us on this trip thirty years ago, and and. Uh, um, and hopefully this will bring back some memories for him. Um, I wanted to share with you a letter that I wrote 30 years ago. Dear Mr. Thompson, last month you were gracious to send me an inscribed copy of At the Edge of Space. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Crossfield's Always Another Dawn and Bergman's 90 Seconds to Space were both very different. Crossfield told his story and not of the X-15, and while Bergman's work was excellent, it was written in 1960, hardly the best perspective on the X-15 program. I was born in 1959 and grew up playing with a model of the X-15. I was, and still am, fascinated by it. As a student of aviation history, I regard the X-15 as the finest research aircraft to ever fly. I might even make the case that the plane is the finest experimental aircraft that will ever take to the air. As a member of Civil Air Patrol, a volunteer auxiliary of the Air Force, I have over the past 10 years conducted numerous searches for missing aircraft. I'd like to investigate an, investor, a, a, an adventure of a lifetime. You could help by putting me in touch with those who can assess the feasibility of that endeavor. With a small group of searchers, I'd like to come to Edwards and get a short tour of Dryden and perhaps briefly meet you. Then we'd proceed to Johannesburg to see if we could find any remaining evidence of the number three aircraft. I know the large significant pieces were recovered in 1967, but to me finding a few fragments of the plane that hold the absolute uh, world altitude record would be like recovering fabric from the right flyer. This idea may sound silly or perhaps fantastic, but to me it's an adventure. To visit Edwards and Dryden, I've already seen the aircraft in Washington and Dayton, to meet you and to research a mystery 25 years old would be exciting. Just to correspond with those involved in the program and pour over old records and topographical maps would be great fun. In 1905, Scientific American continued to deny that the Wrights had successfully flown. Someday the world outside of the aviation community will recognize the significance of the North American rocket plane. Would that I had planned an adventure at the turn of the century looking for scraps of fabric near Kill Devil Hills. I recognize how this adventure seems. The same was said to Robert Ballard in his quest for the Titanic or to Taylor and Epps in their effort to locate and free the lost squadron of P-38s from the ice in Greenland. You're a busy guy and I appreciate that. The demands on your time are those of present day concerns. Consider for a moment a young boy now 33, who used to follow your adventures and would like to spend his two-week vacation having an adventure of his own. Will you help? You know, as soon as I wrote that letter and put it in, in the, the mail, 
I regretted it. It sounded so childish. But a week later, I get a handwritten note from NASA. David, I appreciate your interest in the X-15 and your desire to search for some pieces or parts of the number three aircraft. We may be able to help and offer you uh, some assistance. I talked to Al Harris, the chief of our avionics construction and repair section, and one of our special hosts for VIPs. He indicated an interest in supporting your search effort. Al was involved in the original search for parts and is an off-road enthusiast. I'd suggest you contact him to make arrangements for a visit to Dryden. Uh, I've given him a copy of your letter and he's expecting you to contact him. Let me share with you, uh, right there, okay. Three aspects about the X-15. I wanna share with you why it was an important plane and, um, and why I think it crashed, and um, and tell you a little bit about our our, our hunt for the X-15. So after World War II, the uh, National Advisory Committee on, on Aeronautics, which ended up becoming NASA, uh, had a lot of capability in terms of wind tunnels and uh, a lot of experienced engineers. And they were looking at, um, at aviation. And with the war completed, um, they were particularly interested in uh, compressibility. The idea that if you pl flew a plane fast enough, the, the envelope of air that was surrounding the, the wings and the fuselage uh, would get compressed and uh, the plane would be flying so fast that the air couldn't get out of the way. So theoretically, uh, when you're flying fast enough, the air in front of, of the wings and the fuselage compresses, and it's almost like you're flying into a wall, a sonic wall, uh, this, uh, this, at the speed of sound, Mach 1. So they created an aircraft, uh, the Bell X-1, and flew it with uh, the first liquid rocket engine to power it, and it broke the sound barrier in 1947. So here is showing the early rocket planes, the X-1, the X-2, the X-1A, uh, and you can see what their, their, uh, their high altitude marks, uh, 70,000, 100,000, 125,000 feet, and how fast they were able to go, you know, just barely breaking Mach 1, uh, the, the Navy plane, the D-558 uh, uh, Mark II uh, reached uh, Mach 2 with Scott Crossfield, um, all the way up to, to Mel Apt and the X-2, uh, reaching over three times the speed of sound. But if you compare those to the X-15, the X-15 is off the charts. I mean, the speed, it went hypersonic. It was flying five times, six, almost seven times the speed of sound. And in terms of elevation, it flew so high that there was no oxygen, no atmosphere left. It was actually flying in space. Eight of the 12 guys that flew it had altitude flights where they received astronaut wings for flying this plane. That's why this plane was special. So in World War II, the Germans had a missile, the V-2. It stood 46 feet tall, it weighed 29,000 pounds, and it had a, an, a massive engine that was able to take a 2,200 pound warhead and lob it 200 miles to hit London. So the engine uh, developed 55,000 pounds of thrust and it would burn for about a minute and this thing was hypersonic. It would fly five times the speed of sound. It was an unbelievable power plant. Contrast that to this aircraft on the right. It has a length of 51 feet, it weighs about the same, its engine is about the same, its burn time, you know, maybe burns a little bit longer. Um, and so now you have someone, imagine you could put somebody in a V2 rocket that's flying hypersonic, five times the speed of sound, and yet it's controllable. And you can do experiments in it. And you have a, almost 200 flights over a span of almost 10 years. And you generate 700 reports out of it. It was just, it was phenomenal. It was like nothing else. 
And much of it really comes down to the power plant. So the original liquid uh, rocket engine in the United States was developed by uh, Robert Goddard. And he had uh, some significant influence in, um, in the precursors to the XLR-11. So he designed, designed a liquid rocket engine and then uh, reaction motors and Thiokol and um, Rockwell International. Uh, they were all kind of responsible for, for this, this rocket engine. So the XLR-11, which is a liquid, uh, liquid propulsion rocket, had four chambers. And uh, you could turn on and off the chambers to add additional thrust. Each chamber uh, would give you 1,500 uh, pounds of thrust, or together, the XLR-11 developed 6,000 pounds of, of thrust. And at some point, they were able to kind of optimize that, and they put two of them in there. So you were, at, you were getting 16,000 pounds of thrust. And you can see it in the back of, of the, the X-15 uh, there on the left. And this was until the later part of, of 1960. Uh, this is what was powering the, the, the X-15. To give you an idea what happened when they moved to the big engine, the XLR-99, it had one chamber. And you could throttle it between 50% and 100%, and you could restart it in flight. And at 50%, it was generating 15,000 pounds of thrust, which was kind of the same as the optimized set of two XLR-11s. But when you open this thing up, it was a beast. It, was, it developed 57,000 pounds of thrust, equivalent to like a V2 taking off. So it's thrust, thrust to weight ratio, 62 to one. The, the, uh, the uh, combustion chamber temperature, nearly 5,000 degrees. Imagine that you have to be able to cool a combustion chamber uh, or keep the engine from melting because it's running at 5,000 degrees. And that's what they did in the X-15. So it's responsible <clears throat> for both altitude and speed records. On the right, you see the uh, X-15 number two with external tanks, and it's painted white. That's an ablative coating because the air is getting so hot around the aircraft that it'll actually burn like a blowtorch right through the plane. And uh, it reached a top speed in October of 1967, where it was flying uh, nearly seven times the speed of sound. And had it not started to, to burn through the, the aircraft, um, they could have pushed it further. In terms of altitude, in addition to the speed runs, uh, they did ballistic tests where you would launch from a B-52 and you'd point the nose up 40 degrees, light the engine, and uh, it would run somewhere between a minute, minute and a half, uh, and then you would continue this ballistic arc and you'd be weightless at the top, not unlike uh, the... the uh, the first Mercury flights in in the uh, in the space program, and then you'd come back and with energy management you would uh, be able to to bleed off your your energy and come for a, a controlled landing uh, on a runway. You could you could land on a runway. Uh, these guys would would land on uh, on the dry lake bed, but uh, but they had that sort of precision. And um, and as I said, eight out of twelve of these guys got astronaut wings. For, for flying this plane. <clears throat> to give you a sense, over on the right is uh, a representation of the Mercury capsule for Alan Shepard. Uh, this is 1961, and these are the instruments that he's responsible for. On the left is the X-15, and this is about the same time. Now, with the X-15, they actually created a simulator it's an analog simulator, but you can sit in it and you could be doing your missions and learning how to do things and seeing where the gauges were going and all that sort of thing. For the Mercury program, uh, this, uh, this representation that you see of the instruments, uh, they had this glued on a piece of cardboard and Alan Shepard was like pointing to pieces of it. So, I mean, they're both going into space, suborbital flight. But just to give you an idea of the, the complexity and, and in terms of the responsibilities of the X-15 pilot, you'll see uh, phenomenally um, difficult and important. 
So we're 191 flights into 199. Um, so, so the first flight was in 1959, and this is 1967. And Joe Ingle, who'd been flying the X-15, is now moving on to be a uh, an astronaut. And uh, he ends up flying the space shuttle, by the way. And he said, coming back in the space shuttle, you could close your eyes and you were just, you were landing the X-15 again at, at Edwards. So he gets replaced by uh, Major Mike Adams, uh, who uh, graduated number one in, uh, uh, in test pilot school, uh, very accomplished aviator. And the things that he's responsible for on this flight, uh, in addition to you know piloting the plane, is uh, they have a boost guidance experiment and solar spectrum and ultraviolet plume, and uh, they're actually catching cat catching stardust, you know, micrometeorite collection, uh, wingtip deflection photography. They're testing some insulation for the the Saturn V, you know, because this is 1967. They're they're going to be launching people to the moon in the next year or two. Um, and then they have this transverse probe experiment, which is going to end up being a problem, by the way. Uh, but so he goes into a hypersonic spin, recovers from that spin, but the, the plane breaks up. And you can see uh, in the bottom there, that's the forward fuselage of, of what's left of the X-15 and, and the technicians who'd come out from, from the research facility. Over on the right, there's a gun camera that sits uh, over the right shoulder of a pilot in experimental aircraft. And it takes uh, motion pictures of what's going on on the uh, uh, on the dashboard so, so that you can see what the instruments look like at any particular time. Now, in this particular case with the crash, the, the plane broke apart. And uh, as, the, as the plane was coming apart, <clears throat> the back of the gun camera um, came off and the, the, uh, the film canister came out. And you can see at the bottom, <clears throat> you can see light coming into the, into the cockpit and the, you know, the, uh, uh, the film came out and got overexposed. So I had been involved in perhaps uh, 50 uh, missions to look for aircraft. And now most of these are, you know, Cessna 152, 177s, things like that, uh, small planes. And um, sometimes they're ones that that just uh, didn't report in after their, their flight plan was done, or there was a storm and the ELT that was in the plane got rocked around by the winds and it went off. Uh, and then there was a, you know, a beacon going off. Uh, but the Civil Air Patrol, which are a bunch of volunteers uh, and auxiliary of the Air Force, uh, would be trained by the Coast Guard to conduct um, searches for aircraft. And, and I went through the, the Coast Guard uh, class to be a mission coordinator, and, uh, and I did that for a number of years. So I thought, well, wouldn't this be interesting? I'll take all the information that we know about this missing aircraft, plug it in, and, uh, and we'll go and we'll, we'll do this hunt. So that's what I did. I, I put in uh, what we knew about the pilot, what we knew about the weather conditions. Um, and uh, over on the left, I was working in the emergency room as a nurse uh, in, in the hospital and on their, their uh, publication, um, they, they put a nice story there about, about me going, uh, spending my vacation going out to California and looking for this plane. And over on the right, uh, the Express, which is the uh, the magazine for, for NASA out at Dryden, uh, put in a little article saying, hey, if you want to help, this guy from Civil Air Patrol wants to go out and see if he can find pieces of this plane. So I spent about nine months uh, preparing to, to go out there. And I, I worked with the with some archivists at the Air and Space Museum in Washington and got as much information as I could about the X-15, why it was successful, uh, different elements about it, about the crash, what we knew. And so I drew up this, uh, this image in the middle here, and it shows the flight path. And what the Coast Guard tells you is that if you're looking for an aircraft, 86% of the time, you're going to find it within half a mile left or right of whatever you know, path it was supposed to be on. 
So we, we, we had radar off altimetry that kind of told us where the plane was, and they found most of the big pieces. You know, they found the forward fuselage. Uh, they found the engine. Uh, they found one of the wings. Um, they found a lot of the stuff. But when this thing broke up, it scattered things to the wind. So there was still more stuff out there. So I um, uh, got my, uh, my entourage together. Over on the left is my dad. Um, who now lives in Canton, and, and on the right, my brother, who's an actor in Chicago, um, and, and they, they were like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll come out and, and help tromp around in the Mojave, uh, and we did that, and, and we had a lot of fun, uh, and, and so I broke the area up into, shirt, into um, search grids, and we had two teams that went out, and we ended up, uh, each team went out for three days, uh, and, and I'll show you what we, uh, what we came up with. So we tried to photograph things uh, as we found them uh, and also give you an idea of scale. And that's why it's got a, a, um, a credit card next to it. And I was unclear because this has happened you know, 25 years earlier. Was the stuff going to be buried? Was it going to be, uh, was it going to be a lot of overgrowth? Would we recognize the stuff? You know? uh, so you could, for example, look at this structural uh, bulkhead T uh, you can see a picture of what it looked like sitting there in the grass. And then below that, Dave Stoddard, uh, who was with North American, uh, is examining it. It's a piece of a bulkhead, and it's got the serial numbers of the aircraft on it. So it's clearly from this rocket plane, as opposed to being from some other plane or being you know, something else. S over there in the middle, you can see that's the back of the, the gun camera. Uh, that's the piece that came off, and that's why you know the light came in into that uh, uh, and, and ruined that film, and, and that was kind of interesting. Um, over on the left, the the access panel that's that's actually looking at the inside of the access panel, but that's what the exterior of the of the plane was. It was made out of Inconel X, which is a a nickel alloy uh, that is very similar to what they used on the uh, on the Mercury spacecraft. And um, and Zach, <laughs> the, the kid grinning up on top, uh, is the grandson of uh, of Dave Stoddard, who who worked for North American, worked for for NASA on the on the X-15 program. So the idea to to take his grandson uh, out on a hunt for the plane that his dad used to work on was exciting. And here's uh, Zach finding a you know a piece of the plane. And over on the right, uh, you can see some of these stringers. These were uh, these were used to um, reinforce the wing of the plane. And then the, the tubing that's going through it is, uh, is a propellant that goes to the reaction control jets. Because when you're flying in space, there's no, uh, there's no air to bite with the wings. So you have to use little rocket jets to move around. And, and that's, that's what that's about. So I decided, that I wanted to try to take uh, try to write a report about what I think happened. Um, you know, why did it crash? So I looked at the accident investigation report, and there were things that uh, that are known now, or were known in '93 that weren't known in '67, and there were things that we found. So I wanted to kind of do my own take. So for me, I, I mean, I don't. I don't have a science background. I'm a retired nurse. Um, but the one thing that I was able to bring to the table is um, is the ability to search for missing aircraft. And, and that's something that, that I'd done for a while. And so that was my, my expertise. Uh, but obviously, to figure out what happened to this experimental aircraft, you need some very different people, some very uh, technical kinds of people. So we were, we were blessed to have Dave Stoddard who uh, was a propulsion technician. He'd worked for North American, uh, transferred over to NASA, and he worked on the X-15. And we would be out in the desert, and you would think that the desert would be lifeless and sterile. It's anything but. There's all kinds of activity, animals, bugs, plants, um, and there's all kinds of junk. There are pieces of weather balloons, there, when people go off-roading or, or you know, motorcycles, things like that, you know, the, the fender will fall off or, uh, you know, there's all kinds of junk, man-made junk 
out in the Mojave. So we'd pick up some piece of tubing, and I wouldn't know if that's a weather balloon or it's something off of a car or if it's off of a plane. And if it's off of a plane, is it from our plane? Because there were a number of planes that crashed out there. But Stoddard, he could pick something up and he could tell you exactly what it was, what its composition was, what its use was, whether it was from our plane or not. Now, if it had a serial number and some of them had serial numbers, I could say this is from this plane. But Stoddard, he knew all this stuff cold. Then I talked to Colonel James. He was the chief uh, crash investigator for the Air Force for high-speed accidents. So he was like perfect person to talk to. And during his career, he flew uh, the Shooting Star, the P-80, uh, and then um, the Sabre Jets, the, you know, the 84 and the 86. He was also a U-2 and a SR-71 pilot. So um, very experienced guy. We had the opportunity to uh, sit in the kitchen of, of Bill Peterson. He was an engineer that worked for uh, Minneapolis Honeywell which produces the, uh, well, at the time, produced the stability augmentation system uh, for the X-15 and um, for a number of, of uh, militaries and now civilian um, concerns. And, and this helps to uh, stabilize fly-by-wire flight in aircraft. And lastly, uh, I had some wonderful conversations by phone with uh, Ralph Smith, who has a engineering firm in Tehachapi, not far from, from Edwards. And he's a world expert on pilot-induced oscillations. And that's something that I wanted to touch on too. So this is, this is my take. We wrote this report. And, uh, and when I finished with the report, I sent it off to Scott Crossfield and to Bill Dana and to Neil Armstrong, who was the first guy to fly this plane, the, the number three plane. And uh, they all enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I mean, they recognized I'm a civilian, but um, but they they were very encouraging. So when you have an accident, there's something called the Swiss cheese model. So um, something happens, some specific action or inaction. You forget something on a checklist. Um, like let's say you've got a checklist and it says lower the landing gear before you land, and you forget, you know, or, or somebody interrupts you and and you forget to do that. Well. Um, you're not necessarily going to crash, right? Because you got a co-pilot and he looks at you and he says, hey, you didn't put down the landing gear. So there are lots of things that happen and don't happen that um, either didn't get to be too bad or somebody corrected your mistake or whatever. So you have this Swiss cheese model where there are holes and if all the holes line up, then you're going to have an accident. There's going to be a problem. And so the four things that I wanted to look at were... Uh, the ballistic control system, pilot-induced oscillations, the stability augmentation system, and situational awareness or, or spatial disorientation. So let's touch on those. So one of the things that we found, if you look over on the right, um, you can see these things, these uh, little rockets. Um, they don't produce enough power to, to like push you into orbit, you know, which required like the Saturn V, uh, you know, would have a million pounds of thru uh, thrust to get you up into orbit. This only produces about 100 pounds of thrust. So it's enough to kind of push the nose around when you're in space. So you think of the space shuttle and it's got, you know, these little rockets on the front of it. It's just to change your, your attitude in space. Well, uh, over on the left here, you can see this is part of the, uh, uh, the left wing. And you, here you can see the ribs. Uh, and you can see item item L was was some of those ribs that we found, and uh, and then the the tubing that goes to the reaction control jet. And what was interesting when we disassembled it is we noticed that there was an O ring missing. So if you look up on the top here, this white piece of Teflon there uh, is is in one of the lines, but the other one didn't have one. So the last time this thing and and this was. This was all together when we found it. So obviously when somebody last cleaned it or inspected it or you know whatever, they didn't put that Teflon ring in. And so that system would have been leaking or uh, it might not have been operative. I mean, it, they may have run out of propulsion, uh, uh, a propellant and not been able to 
to orient correctly when it's coming back from space. So that was something that they didn't know in 67. You know, it's something that we found when we were in the desert. Uh, the second one is, is the idea of a pilot-induced oscillation. So uh, aircraft are designed to be stable. Um, if you have a Cessna 172 and you put it into a spin or you do something crazy with it, and then you just kind of let go, it will right itself and it will just, it'll be fine, all right? But the, the, if you have an interaction between a pilot and an aircraft, an aircraft is trying to do something, a pilot is putting in inputs with the stick, uh, there are situations where that becomes unstable and you get this feedback loop. Like let's say that um, like there's a lot of give in, in the stick. So um, all of a sudden you're headed towards the ground and you pull back real sharply, but it takes a while for the plane to come back and then it starts to come back, but it's coming back too much. So you dump the stick forward. What ends up happening is you get this thing called a pilot induced oscillation and it it's not an uncommon um, problem with aircraft. So over on the left, you can see um, the Corsair, the F4U, uh, lots of planes, the F-86, uh, the Century Series, the Starfighter, the 104, um, you know, a whole bunch of planes, the X-15, uh, you know, um, lots of planes ended up having pilot-induced oscillations. And, um, and those can be unrecoverable. So one of the questions was, and, and we've learned a lot since 67, could that have been, could that have been a, a possibility with this crash? And there are different types of, of uh, PIO. There are actually three different types, and it, it's not really important to get into that. Uh, but space shuttle, uh, PIO, over on the right, the, the flying uh, bathtub, that's the M2F2, um, PIO, even modern things like, you know, the, the C-17 in the lower left. Uh, I mean, that's designed by computers, you know, built by, uh, by Boeing. That had PIO. As well as the as well as the X fifteen, and PIO is kind of a funny thing. So here are two questions: Can aircraft that have passed certification and are generally acceptable have acceptable ha handling, you know, qualities, still have PIO? And the answer is they can. So the T thirty eight A, which is the Talon, you know, that that it's the advanced trainer for the Air Force or, or that the astronauts fly, uh, that had PIO issues, even though it's a, a very decent plane. By the same token, can you have an aircraft that's very difficult to control? And if that's the case, does that mean that it's PIO prone? And the answer is no. You could have something like, let's take the, the U-2 reconnaissance plane. The band between stall speed and overspeed is very, very narrow. It needs to fly within like 10 knots of being, you know, where it needs to be. So you have to be an exceptional pilot. And yet it's not, it's not giving you these, these oscillations where uh, you get this unrecoverable interaction between pilot and, and aircraft. So PIO is, is its own little deal. And then there's the stability augmentation system. So um, as aircraft move to fly-by-wire and going faster, um, there was an interest in having the aircraft, in addition to the pilot, you know, moving the stick, uh, having the aircraft have air data sensors and motion sensors and figure out exactly what was going on, what the, what the, the wind was doing to the plane, uh, what the pilot was, was doing with, with, his responses and to give it a sense, a, a set of, of parameters. Say, you know, I don't want it to exceed this bank angle or I don't want uh, it to pitch up this much. And, and it would augment the, uh, the movements by the pilot and it would smooth some of those things out and make it better to fly, easier to fly. And so this stability augmentation system in this case from, uh, from Minneapolis Honeywell uh, was with the X-15. And when that was, when they were using the MH-96, 
uh, during speed runs, if it popped out, if the circuit breaker popped out, you could you could just pop the circuit breaker back in, or if it didn't work, you could you could probably land, or, you know, declare an emergency or something like that. But it was not it was not uncommon to have a problem with that. But when you were doing the ballistic altitude ones, when you went out of the atmosphere and you were coming back from space, if the stability augmentation system went out, you had some real problems. And in this particular flight, um, it kept cutting in and out. And the thought is that there were transient electrical signals that were coming from one of the experiments out on the, the wing pod, and that that was messing with the stability augmentation system. So it would it would be working and then not working. And uh, as he's coming back from space, he goes into this hypersonic spin, which is a spin greater than, than Mach 5. And he's able to, to straighten this thing out. But um, but then it, it, it goes into this, this terrible, um, like porpoising. And, uh, and I think the plane beat him to death. And, and, and the question is, was the stability augmentation system either actively doing that or not working and keeping that from happening? And that's that's a real possibility. And lastly, the idea of uh, of spatial disorientation. So when you have a Navy pilot that's taking off from a carrier, and you know they they have a catapult and they they throw the guy off the carrier, um, there's you you have this this zoom where where all of a sudden your your all of the the fluid in your inner ear and the little hairs and stuff like that are like going in all kinds of directions and it takes a couple of seconds for the guy who's come off a carrier to kind of get back to where he's at so proprioception or the 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 idea that you have a sense of where your body is or what uh you know which way it's up and you know that sort of thing has to do with your inner ear and, and, you know, that seat of the pants flying, you know, I feel this amount of gravity in my butt and that tells me that I'm like going up or going down. And with zoom proprioception, these guys are getting in this rocket ship and all of a sudden they light this thing and they're going like a V2 missile. They're going five, six times the speed of sound. Um, you can imagine that would be incredibly disorienting. Um, and you don't have a lot of time to catch up because this thing, the, the flight may be 10 minutes, okay? But the engine is only running for 60, 70, 80 seconds. So you have to you have to be on top of things, maybe even ahead of things. So they spend a lot of time in a simulator. So where Alan Shepard may have just had a piece of cardboard that he was pointing to in 1960, 1961, these guys actually had, it was an analog, but they had a, simulator. They had an X-15 that they would sit in, and uh, as they made inputs, uh, you know, the dials would change, and they had, uh, you know, a test conductor who was putting them through different things, so they could practice their 10-minute flight 10, 20, 30, 40 times. Now, this is wonderful, okay? Now, obviously, you don't get the kinds of uh, centrifuge kinds of, uh, you know, G-forces that you would get in, in some of the modern kinds of, of simulators, but, but that was great. But in addition to the zoom proprioception, the idea that you couldn't really trust um, the seat of your pants or your inner ear, um, and, and, and you were kind of confused and dazed, um, is the idea of uh, the cockpit design being different. So as you're, you got three airplanes, number one, number two, and number three. Uh, number two, after it crashed, they rebuilt it so that it would do uh, the speed flights. And the number three, they kind of, uh, they like to do the altitude flights with that one. So the, the instruments that they would put in these planes, um, they'd change them out over time. So you could see uh, over on the left, the orientation of the, uh, uh, the scanning that you would do to look at the different instruments is different than it is on the bottom. Here you can see um, these these tapes for for speed and altitude. They were looking at different ways of visually 
displaying things. So instead of trying to read a little dial and say, well, does that say 40 or 60, um, having a tape that showed you you're in the green zone or something like that might be a lot easier for pilots. So they were changing things. So the, the instruments in the number one plane and the number three plane might be different, and they may not have caught up to putting the new instrument in the simulator. So here you are, you're flying at five times the speed of sound, you've got zoom proprioception issues, right? You can't see, on most airplanes, you look out the window and you can see your wings and you can see where you're going. With this plane, you couldn't see your wings and you're like painted, uh, pointed up towards space. I mean, there's really, and there's just a little slit for a window, there really isn't a lot that you can, you can look out. So you can't trust the seat of your pants. You can't really see where you're going. The instruments might be different on different planes. And then what would happen if something goes wrong with the plane, like the st stability augmentation system keeps cutting out? Or, um, or some of the instruments don't, th there's a lag in the instruments. That could be a big problem. And when he re-entered, so he, he goes ballistic and he gets up to the top of the ballistic arc. And as he comes back, uh, he's yawing, and as he re-enters the atmosphere, he's actually 90 degrees to the direction of flight. And one of the possibilities was that he thought he was lined up with a different instrument, that, that the instrument that was in that particular plane, or it had been different from in the simulator, that he was flying the wrong axis on, a, on, a, uh, uh, on, on one of the, the instruments. So whether or not it was lagging or whether or not it was uh, giving him bad information or whether or not he'd run out of propellant out of his left wing or, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But these are all possibilities of why the guy crashed. But I want to leave you with this. Um, in 1927, Charles Lindbergh flew the Atlantic and he wrote a book called We. And I've thought about that. And when they talk about the Lone Eagle, this was a solo pilot that flew the Atlantic. When he talks about we, um, you know, where is the accomplishment in that flight? Was the, the accomplishment the pilot? Well, I mean, certainly there's something about that, right? But it's not just Lindbergh, right? It's also the Spirit of St. Louis. It's that airplane. And it's not just that airplane. It's the right whirlwind um, engine. They had built an engine, a single, uh, single engine airplane, where there were no problems with the engine for the 33 hours it took to fly from America to France. So does the, is the accomplishment that engine? Because it couldn't have been done without the engine. Uh, is the accomplishment the aircraft? Is the accomplishment the pilot? Well, it's, it's kind of all of them, right? So when you think of the X-15, uh, you know, we certainly think of the pilots. There were a dozen of them, starting with Crossfield and ending with Bill Dana. And uh, people like Neil Armstrong, who was the first to fly the number three aircraft. And, uh, and when I sent him the, the crash report, he sent me back that, that picture on the right. And you can just see that wry smile as he's about to climb into the X-15. And he says, uh, you know, best wishes. Um, but it's all three of these things, right? It's it's the XLR-99, it's the X-15, and it's these marvelous pilots. So what a, a tremendous uh, program, uh, tremendous legacy. And uh, and I was really pleased to have uh, contacted, you know, Crossfield and Dana and Thompson and, um, and Armstrong. And uh, it was a wonderful time. And so I just, I leave you with that. Uh, here's a, a picture uh, looking at the, uh, um, at all of the aircraft that they were working on at the same time in NASA. So in the back there, you see the lifting bodies that were the precursors to the space shuttle. And, um, and over on the right are all three X-15s. I mean, it must've been an incredible time to, uh, to be with NASA. So if, uh, if, if this is something that, that you've enjoyed, um, tell Robert that you want more of this stuff, or if there's something that, that you want to talk about, uh, please share that with him. And, and I would, I'd be 
I'd be happy to come back. Robert, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, David. And to David's point, uh, folks, uh, make sure to fill out that feedback survey I send along with the recording in, in the email uh, later today. Uh, and uh, that'll be a great opportunity for you to provide feedback. So if you have any comments for David, please get them into the chat. If you have any questions for David, please get them into the Q&A. Uh, we certainly have about uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, JM would like to know, did Major Adams eject and survive? Um, <clears throat> he did not. Uh, radar altimetry um, had him, he, he peaked out at 266,000 feet, which is at 50 miles. And that's, that's just at the edge of space. Um, and when he came back, he went into a hypersonic spin. They were able to, he was able to control that. Um, but then he started going into this, this up-down pitch business porpoising uh, at about 80,000 feet. And uh, the plane broke apart at 62,000. So he was uh, he was trying to get it under control, and and you know the the distance between the guy's helmet and the top of the the uh, the inside of the cockpit is probably about an inch. So you know you can imagine that uh, the guy may have been beat to death. Um, he was he was certainly um, you know trying to get it down on the ground, and and the the plane you you could eject out of this plane. Uh, you could eject going uh, at least Mach three. I'm not sure quite how fast. But um, I, I think he was he was trying to get it under control, and um, and he might have might have brought it back. I mean, there are certainly a, a number of instances uh, where uh, the X-15 had emergency landings, and uh, and these very skilled pilots brought it back. So, uh, David, just to kind of um, bottom line it for us, uh, Scott asks, uh, in your opinion, what do you think was the cause of the crash? Um, I, I, th I think, I think that, um, he reoriented, he, he re-entered the atmosphere, uh, 90 degrees to his flight path. And I, I think the, um, uh, the stability augmentation system, whether it was working or not, I'm not sure, um, would have been unable to, uh, to correct for that, um, I mean, when you see pieces of the plane, it looks like a bomb went off, but it's really just the air that, that tore the thing apart. So, you know, with the Swiss cheese, you know, maybe it was the MH96, maybe it was uh, the the leaky uh, propellant tank on the left. Uh, maybe he was disoriented because of Zoom stuff. Um, it could be a lot of things, but I, I think I, my guess is that if the the simulator and all three planes had the same instruments in them, um, it would have been less likely that someone might have actually been trying to fly something that was 90 degrees to, to the flight path. Uh, Scott uh, also asks, what was the disposition of all the parts that you found? Uh, they're sitting in my attic. Yeah, so so th that was one of the disappointments uh, about this. I mean, I, I love going out there. Uh, we interviewed a lot of guys. We um, we took the videotapes and they got made. There's a there's a, a guy that does something called spacecraft films, and if you look, uh, he's got one on the X-15, and we we put a, a number of our videos there. Um, with the pieces that that we found of the plane, um, I approached the Smithsonian and said, uh, you know, I I'd like like you guys to have this stuff, and their response was, um, we'd be happy to take it, but just know it will never it'll never be seen by anybody. We, we will simply store it. They said, you know, we're able to show less than 1% of the stuff that we've got and showing a pile of, of you know, broken airplane pieces in, in going to be one of them. Uh, I tried approaching a number of, of other museums um, with the same kind of intent, you know, that if we could create <clears throat> some small little thing <clears throat> to highlight the X-15 and its contributions, that would be great. And when I talked to the Air Force, because, you know, they have a wonderful museum at Wright Pat. Um, the guy says, we have an X-15. Why would we want your pieces? And it's like, okay. I mean, my response is, you know, if you had the Nina and the Pinta, would you want the Santa Maria? Uh, I mean, this is the first plane uh, to fly into space. It was first flown by Neil Armstrong. Um, you know, it it was the most important um, uh, technical um, contributor 
to uh, the creation of, of Mercury procedures, Apollo procedures, the space shuttle, energy management stuff. Um, I mean, it was phenomenal. And, and yet, you know, I mean, that's why I'm doing this, right, is, is because I find it interesting and, and uh, I want to keep this, this part of the history alive. Uh, did your incident report have any different opinions than the original? No, not really. Um, um, they weren't they weren't terribly conclusive. Um, it was it was difficult to tell. I mean, they had the radar uh, altimetry stuff. They they knew everything about the pilot and about the condition of the plane. Um, pilot induced oscillations were not as well known in 67 as they were. It was a landmark study that came out in 77. And then since then, um, there's been a lot of work that's been done on PIO and, and, and that's a lot better understood. Um, the, the Zoom proprioception, yeah, I mean, that some of that was known. Um, I, I feel like I put an emphasis on some things that, that weren't really known at that time. And so for a, uh, you know, for an amateur, um, I'm, I'm proud of what we did. Uh, so good segue into our next question. Uh, as a result of the publication of your report, what, if anything, changed? Oh, nothing. What, what it does, what I hope it does, is it fills in a little bit of history. So I sent it to uh, the, the Air Force historian. As a matter of fact, it was wonderful. I, I, was, I was in D.C. and uh, Dr. Hallian, who is... Uh, um, who, wrote, who wrote Frontiers of Flight, he was introducing me around as, as Mr. X-15. And I mean, what, what, <laughs> what a delightful thing to say to somebody who, you know, I'm, I'm not an author, I'm not a historian, but I'd obviously had this, you know, this passion for it. Um, but but the, the report that I wrote, uh, they put it in, in a number of libraries. And, um, and so I, I think it helps to present a little bit fuller picture about, about what happened. All right, David, uh, we're in the lightning round portion of our Q&A. Uh, we've got about, uh, I don't mind staying a few minutes late, David, but we've got about five minutes. Okay. Um, JM asks, do you ever display the pieces you found? Um, I try to. Um, I, I, I'm a solar system ambassador, which means I'm a volunteer with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And I love to go out and give talks. Uh, and we, we were just at a school um, about a week and a half ago. Uh, in Brookline in Massachusetts. And uh, this was an elementary school and it, it was a, a STEM night. So uh, science, technology, that kind of stuff. And I brought some pieces of the plane and we kids could pick it up and touch it and we'd talk about it. And uh, when, whenever I can, I can pull it out, uh, I do that. Uh, Jane wants to know what happened to the rest of the plane beyond uh, your pieces? Um, I think it just goes in a junk pile. Uh, you know, initially, uh, they need it for the accident investigation. Uh, but, you know, planes crash all the time and they crashed at Edwards all the time. So it's it's not something where they say, oh, well, this is important, let's keep it. Um, it just, it goes into the, you know, the, the dustbin of history. Uh, how many X-15s were built? Uh, there were three. The first one, which was flown by all 12, uh, is in the Smithsonian. Uh, and the number two, which was the speed flight, um, that one's in uh, in Ohio at the Air Force Museum, and then number three is in my my attic. There you go. Um, under uh, Enid would like to know under normal conditions, how difficult was the X fifteen uh, to fly as a glider on return to land? Gli glider, excuse me. Uh, mm -hmm. Under normal circumstances, how difficult was the X fifteen to fly as a glider on return to land? Well, it's it's difficult. Okay, uh, first of all, it's it's going to have very similar characteristics to landing the space shuttle, which they said was like landing a brick. Okay, the lift to drag ratio is is um, is very very small. You can see how how small the wings are when you think of a sailplane. It's got very very long wings. Um, this one is going to come in really fast, and uh, you you have to be ahead of the airplane. Uh, I believe this may be your father or, or a relative uh, asking, do you remember the first piece you found? Well, I remember the first piece that was found. It was found by my brother. 
And so he finds a little piece of the exterior of the plane. And he said that for a moment, just before he picked it up, he was wondering if it was still hot. Uh, Tom would like to know what issue of Quest was your article in? Oh, you know, I, I should figure that out. That was a wonderful um, uh, magazine, Quest. I think, it, I think it's still around. Um, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, I will figure that out and I'll, I'll send that information to Robert. And if you get that, it had several good articles on the X-15 on it, not just mine. Well, uh, David, you've answered uh, 10 uh, questions. Um, I think we have a couple of real quick ones if you want. Uh, oh, sure. JM asks, is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory still in Pasadena? Yes, yes. And they do. Uh, so when you think of the, the Manned Space Flight Center in Houston, th that controls uh, manned space flight. But unmanned things like uh, satellites, that's controlled at JPL. Did the pilot who passed away uh, leave a family behind, uh, do you know? He did, he did. And not uh, not too many years ago, uh, a uh, an Eagle Scout uh, put up a memorial in the desert and there was a nice ceremony. And um, if, if you go to, uh, uh, to the Kennedy Space Center, there's a, a mirror that's dedicated to astronauts that have, that have passed away. And one of those astronauts is, uh, is Mike Adams from the X-15. All right, David, so let's wrap it there. Uh, folks, let's give David a big virtual round of applause. Uh, look for an email from me later today with the recording and the feedback survey. Uh, David, do you have any last words for the audience? I don't, I'm, I'm so pleased that, that we have such a, a wonderful participation rate, uh, that, that people come to listen and, and to participate and, and thank you for the invitation. Yeah, great turnout, especially uh, with the 80 degree weather today in Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all so much. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Enjoy this weather and look for that email. So thanks so much. Have a great one. Thanks, David. Thank you, Robert.